innocent person walks into prison and gets a front row view. If you want to know exactly what goes on, you can hear it from me. Because I was right down there with them. I slept where they slept. I ate what they ate. I worked where they worked. This is the unique experience for people who've been wrongly convicted. But still, I mean, it's fascinating. The guy on the left side of me is in prison for killing someone. The guy behind me raped and killed two people. The guy on this side robbed and killed somebody. Society sees the demon on TV. I saw the demon up close. But I also witnessed the human element right alongside the demon. I saw the man struggling to come to terms with his crime. Really? Sometimes even I was moved to tears. I can say in all honesty, I didn't kill anyone. I didn't rob anyone. I didn't rape anyone. I'm here for something someone said I did. Hey, hey, November 15, 1975, 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning, two months after my 20th birthday. And all the evil come knocking on my door. I'm sleeping. Bam, bam, bam. I jump up. Bam, bam. I've heard that's how evil comes. Dark as night. Don't want to be seen. Bam, woke my mom up. She said, who is that banging on the door? I said, I don't know, ma. But I think it's the police. She said, well, open that door. Ain't no sense in them tearing it down. Pull me out of my bed to this madness. Took me 27 and a half years to get home. I had no idea what went on in jail. I wasn't trying to find out. One friend had went to jail. That was my only exposure when I went to visit with him on Tulane and Broad Streets at Orleans Parish Prison. The first thing I saw was hopelessness. But the most overpowering thing was the smell. It was his own perfume. A real heavy odor. Anyone that ever been back to Tulane and Broad can testify to the stench. It covers you like a blanket. It's years and years and years and years of sweat. Of fear. Stench from fear is sickening. Like rot. Decayed, all the corruption and evil that's been through there, depression and oppression, it's the stench of death and brutality, all that accumulated like the water in Katrina, so powerful it's a presence, it's like walking in the bits of hell. When I went visit this guy, I think some of the evil inside the place got on me. I feel like some kind of evilness embedded itself in my body and decided, I want him back in here. Get him back in here. Bam! I jump up, open the door. Police asked that Gregory Bright live here. Yeah. That's me. They got a warrant for my arrest for the murder of Elliot Porter. 15 years old. Two gunshot wounds to the head. Killed on Halloween morning. His body was discovered under a building in the Calio Projects. I lived in the projects. But I didn't know Elliot Porter. I'd never even been in a serious fight. They asked did I own a weapon. I never owned a weapon. To this day, I never owned a weapon. They said they were gonna bring me downtown and ask me some questions. My mom said, yeah, all right, because my son didn't kill anybody. I was arrested in violation of, of revised statute 1430.1, second degree murder. They brought me over to all these parish prison on tier 83. That's where I learned I had a 17 year old co-defendant. Prior to our arrest, I had no association with this co-defendant. 
Neither of us had a criminal record. We sat in all these parish prisons eight months waiting for our trial, living in close proximity with all these guys, sit on a toilet, shower, in full view of each other, all your weaknesses exposed. Any kind of fear? You looked it straight in the face. My co-defendant had a paid lawyer, but being an indigent defendant, I had a state lawyer. He only met with me once before trial. Representing the state was Henry P. Julian and Patrick G. Quinlan from the DA's office under Harry Connick Sr. Before the trial, they tried to get me to accept a plea for five years. Five years seemed like a life sentence, especially for something I didn't do. Before they set the trial date, I was just clinging to the hope that someone would intervene and say, look, we got the wrong man. Let him out. But when they set the trial date, I knew it wasn't nothing good. During trial, four people testified for the state. A newspaper delivery boy who discovered the body, the victim's mother, one of the arresting detectives, and finally, a woman by the name of Sheila. Sheila said she was sitting in her third floor bedroom window at 1 a.m. and saw the three of us running. We moved out of her view and she heard two loud noises like gunshots. Bang! Bang! When Sheila was asked if she know me, she replied, I just know him by Slim. When asked did I have a mustache or a goatee, she replied, I can't say if he had or not. She never saw a shooting or a gun. The prosecution didn't reveal that Sheila was a paid witness, that she was a paranoid schizophrenic heroin addict who suffered from hallucinations, and that she had to testify under a false name to hide her own criminal history. All this was withheld from my defense by the police department and the DA's office. They also withheld my 18-page police report that revealed multiple witnesses had identified two other people as the perpetrators. There was blood at the scene that was never tested. It was classified as a typical project murder. Whatever that means. Sheila testified the murder happened around 1 a.m. 20 years later, I found out the coroner's report put the time of death between 7 and 8 a.m. But my defense didn't have a copy of the coroner's report. The coroner was a state witness which means the defense can't question him unless the state calls him to the stand. The DA made sure the coroner never took the stand. It's clever and it's devious how the law can be manipulated, strategic, true and true. They were ruthless in getting a conviction. It's just a sad situation. And these guys are sworn to uphold the integrity and dignity of the DA's office. My lawyer's whole defense, he didn't do it. 13 minutes of deliberation by a jury, guilty as charged. Me and my co-defendant was both sentenced to serve the balance of our natural life at hard labor in custody of the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola, Louisiana, without benefit of parole, probation, or suspension of sentence. There was a lot of handshaking going on by the DAs. My mom and my girlfriend Claudette, they were in tears. If victim families knew what went on in prison, they would feel less compelled to sentence someone to death. A life sentence is a death sentence. No possibility of parole, there's no hope. Every second, of every hour, of every day, of every month, and every year, is a dead sentence. It ain't nothing nice. And I got to see it from innocent eyes. Seven of us handcuffed and laid down together in the back of a paddy wagon little benches. It's a two to three hour ride from Orleans Parish Prison to Angola. 
but it seemed like it took us forever. Especially the 20 mile stretch off Highway 61 on that road that leads to Angola. These cruel twists and turns on a snake road through the wilderness. If someone said we would end up in hell, that snake road certainly was a trip that would lead to hell. Imagine, you was in a movie and all these creatures popped up every five minutes. Freddy Krubler, Jason, Chucky, all of them. That's Angola. Angola is the bottom of the barrel. You had to be drawn away to go to Angola. Life of 50 or 150 fat. Maximum security prison. 5,000 inmates. Now it's 6,000. The only people qualified for a bed in Angola is those guys who are sentenced to die in that bed. It's the last stop. Angola used to be a slave plantation. The name Angola originates from the Africans who worked the plantation. Camp A used to be the old slave camp. I mean, that's something else to be part of such a long, long history. How do you claim a spot that's littered with blood? I'm talking about hundreds of years of brutality. The pain and suffering that land caused. The violence that exists on them grounds. Angola is 18,000 acres. Surrounded on three sides by the Mississippi River. And on the fourth side by the Tunica Hills. Infinity is the size of Angola. The individual inmate is a small spot in this big picture. He's broken down to a bed, 